As the year 2018 comes to a close, the world is facing its greatest humanitarian crisis since World War II. Based on the 2017 United Nations High Commission for Refugees reporting period, an estimated 68.5 million people have been forcibly displaced from their homes, with 52% of the displaced being children. Many were internally displaced, meaning they were forced to flee their homes but didn't cross international borders. What is a refugee? Simply put, a refugee is someone who has been forced to flee his or her home or country because of persecution, war, or violence. Europe especially is currently facing its biggest immigration challenge since the establishment of the European Union. But how did we get here? What these countries have in common is the main reason for the displacement of their citizens. Persecution, be it religious, racial, or otherwise, and an enduring level of conflict with severe violence. South Sudan, embroiled in a civil war since 2013, and Afghanistan in its civil war with the Taliban. Eritrea and its authoritarian regime forcing their young men into indefinite military service. Syria in its much covered war, which started in 2011, parallel to the wake of the Arab Spring, have all contributed to the wave of migration and the ensuing onslaught of refugees. An estimated 13 million Syrians have fled their homes since the outbreak of their own civil war that began in March of 2011. Neighboring countries, including Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey, have sheltered 5.6 million Syrian refugees, but are now at a breaking point. With humanitarian funding falling short and severe overcrowding in neighboring host countries, there's little option for those desperate for a safer life but Europe. The worsening of the situation in Libya, where African refugees might previously have been able to find jobs and enjoy a simple life, now forces them to cross the Mediterranean Sea to reach the European continent. All these factors have led to a surge in migrants. In Europe, more than one million arrived in 2015, compared to 283,500 in 2014. The world is watching this crisis unfold. But it's a picture on the front page of every newspaper and media reports in September of 2015 that will cement the popular outcry over the crisis. Good evening. It's rare that we have to warn you right from the top of the newscast about what you're about to see, but the photo we're going to show you has quickly resonated across the world as a heartbreaking symbol of an utter human catastrophe that we can't close our eyes to. My name is Claire Mosley. Um, in 2015, I started the charity Care for Calais. We deliver direct aid, so clothes, food, sleeping equipment, to refugees, mostly in northern France, um, but also in Brussels and occasionally in Italy. 
I went to Calais just for a trip, but when I got there, it was extremely shocking seeing the people who were in so much need. It'd just been a bit of a social media explosion about the refugees. So people were turning up in Calais with cars and vans full of aid, but the camp was chaotic. It was full and overcrowded and there wasn't a reasonable way of getting the aid into the camp. We opened a warehouse. Um, we spent a lot of time on Facebook at night telling people to come to the warehouse, telling them what we needed, what we didn't need, how to get there. And then when they arrived, we got them to bring the stuff to the warehouse rather than dumping it outside the camp. It just so happened that the smallest bit of project management was something that could sort that out and fix that problem. Um, and that's something that I could very easily do. Really tired, not just morning. Hello, morning. morning. Goodbye. Hello. I'm guessing you're new. Hi. <laughs> I'm Sarah. Nice Thank to meet you. Sarah. My name's Sarah. I'm 46. I'm from the UK, but I live in the southwest of France. I'm a temporary <laughs> warehouse coordinator. I come in, I open the warehouse, deal with the admin side of things that need to be done here, make sure that I'm ready for when the volunteers come through the doors, roughly about 10 o'clock. So, first things first, we will be doing a debriefing where I will cover this, but as you are here and it's on, can you sign in and grab a gilet? Thank you. Claire, the CEO of Care for Calais, and I met when she'd been here for about a week before me in 2015. And she then went on to do Care for Calais. I went on to Care for Refugees that were in Dunkirk. And we, our paths have always met and we've been friends ever since, really. Well, Care for Calais tries to provide as much as it can and not always with dignity. It's extremely difficult, but we do our best with what we've got. Hi, is everybody ready to come sit down so we can do the briefing, please? <coughs> I'm temporarily helping out here, trying to lead you all in the right direction, so bear with. So our plan today, we more or less are sure of, is toiletry pack and a food pack. Then those packs need making. <laughs> you all love that sound. Um, those packs need making. We also need to count and check um, our sleeping bags, and we also need to assess exactly how many tarpaulins we have. Those are the jobs in hand for this morning. A trolley, I suppose, would be the best thing to put them into because they're going to be heavy. We're about to start making up food parcels. So what that means is putting in tins of things like kidney beans, butter beans, tin fish. Um, little details that we have to concentrate on are things like making sure that we only put in tins that have ring pulls. It's, um, it's never good enough, but it's just trying to find a food parcel that is something that is useful immediately to somebody. I think Care for Calais is exceptional in the fact that nearly everybody I've met that everybody I have met, literally, they all genuinely care. So that they're here to do what they can. I'm James Cartwright, I'm 44, and I'm from Carlisle, which is in England just about, it's just underneath Scotland. My name is Anna Fielding, I am 26 years old. Uh, my name is Michaela, I'm 24 years old, and I'm from Rome. I'm Carol, I'm 25 years old. I'm Nicole, I'm 25, I'm from Australia and I live in London. David, I am 22 years old. Uh, I born and grew up in Iran, but originally I am from Israel. I am with my brother Jacob. Uh, Jacob Gerji, 21 years old. Yeah, my name's Andy, I'm 62, I'm retired, uh, I'm from London. It's Joanne Siri, I am 41, and I have been in Calais since last Thursday. I care for Calais for seven months. I've been here for the weekend. This is my second day. This week I'm here for 10 days. I've been coming since October 2015. Really, I managed to come down for a few days at a time, ideally with a van load of donations, this time just with a car load. Um, but we've, our group in Carlisle gathers donations all year round and whenever we've got enough, we'll try and get them here somehow, either with us or collaborating with other groups in the UK. We bring tin, tins over and you put crackers and water in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this would start taking the crackers out of the plastic. Oh, thing. yeah. Okay, 
Uh, my name is Virginia, I've been here, I arrived today, I've been to Calais already before um, for just three days. It's quite easy to get here from London where I work um, and I came here because I've got an interest in migration, uh, an academic interest and because I think ideally I'd like to work in the field um, so I think I need to see what it's like on the field to work in the field if you get what I mean. It's scary the first time you come because you don't know what to expect, but it's a good experience and I think it's quite helpful. Uh, even if you don't want to do this in life, you know, I think it's good to see what's going on. I'm just putting, these ones don't have tissues, so they're going to get wet white. But like, there should be, there's already a hundred. My name's Alvaro, Alvaro Ortega, I'm 19. This is my third time this summer. I came beginning of July for like 10 days or so, and I've come back and now I don't know how long I can stay for. It's just a lot of hard work, a lot of stress, and it's just not as easy, as good as it looks. It's very stressful, very hard work, but it's rewarding. You know what? Three, they make such a difference, and they do. But you need to remind people sometimes that these little tedious jobs, they're so important. And so, you know, when they are changing boxes around thinking for the hundredth box, am I ever going to stop finding boxes? You can then break it down and say, well, actually, you're doing an amazing job, because thanks to you, next week when we need to find four boxes of medium jumpers, I know exactly where they are, exactly how many is in there, and we're ready to go and help people instantly. I think nearly every volunteer I've met Certainly the last couple of weeks has been exceptional. I can't fault today. You are absolutely brilliant. So, any questions? How often do you distribute clothing? How often do we get clothing? <laughs> Truthfully, we'd love to do it every day because we know it's so essential. We have no t-shirts now, new or second hand. We have basically no men's underwear, no men's socks. We have coats, which are very inappropriate right now. Jumpers but not substantial amounts. So ideally, I'd love to do um, a distribution to every area of clothing every week because it's essential. There's no washing machines. There's no, you know, all the things we take for granted, they haven't got. But if we don't have the aid and we don't have the donations, we can't make that happen. So we do our best with what we have. It's never enough. It never feels enough. But are they solely reliant on groups like us for food and stuff? All the associations, if we're not here providing, these people will starve and die of cold. It's quite literally that situation. The water was turned off three days ago in Paris to make sure that no homeless person, mainly refugee, had any access to water in this heat. Incredibly frustrating. And you see these people and you're seeing these children and you see the contrast between that shop that's selling a five, ten grand dress and that couple across the road that are trying to sleep in a tent with three kids with nothing and then someone walks past and gives them something to eat. That's the reality of what being a refugee is like in France. It's pretty awful. Most refugees have trying to claim asylum and they're still not having their basic human rights net. Oh, it makes me so cross. We better stop this conversation, I think, right about now. We've done a really good job, because without you guys making that work so well, it doesn't work well. And the people that we hurt are the refugees, the people we're here to help. Well done. Hey. And grab a photo. Whatever we do is never enough, so we've just got to keep doing what we can. Yeah. Well, I love the quote, like you can't help everyone, but you can help someone. Yeah. That's everyone brilliant. can help someone. Yeah. yeah. It's a very big mantra. My yeah. other one is like stick. Uh, well, the one that uh, how I try to describe everything is like putting a stick in plaster on an arterial bleed. Yeah. That's what it feels yeah. like. And three is. Do you know what? In 2015, when we first came up here, I was like, we've just got to get through the winter. We'll get through the winter, and then they're all going to realise you can't possibly ignore the situation anymore. It's too big. It's exploded. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. fourth winter coming in this year, and yeah. it's worse than it was. The tiny coastal city of Calais in northern France is the principal ferry crossing point between France and England. The Dover to Calais ferries that connect France with England run up to 38 times a day and take about an hour and 30 minutes to get from one side to the other. Calais is also connected to the UK by the Channel Tunnel, 
a rail tunnel beneath the English Channel that carries both passenger trains and road vehicle shuttles. For those reasons, Calais has become the preferred route for refugees attempting to reach the UK in the past two decades. In 2001, about 1,600 refugees, mostly Kosovans, Turks, and Afghans, were being housed in a warehouse in Sangat, just outside of Calais. They were all attempting to get across the English Channel into the UK. At that time, neither the French nor the British government wanted to take responsibility for the refugees and the ensuing conflicts. So instead, Sangat was shut down in 2002. In 2003, at a summit between then-French President Jacques Chirac and UK Prime Minister Tony Blair, Le Touquet was signed, a document designed to have both France and Britain secure juxtaposed border control. This agreement moved the French frontier to Kent, UK, and the UK frontier placed squarely in Calais, France. Both borders now seem closer than ever to each other. Between 2011 and 2016, Media reports estimated 10,000 refugees were living rough in Calais. Local non-government organizations put the number closer to 17,000, almost all wanting to go to the UK. Today, the number changes frequently, with the French government's constant movement of these refugees throughout France. As of completion of this documentary, more than 3,700 refugees were scattered in and around Calais. England is supposed to be the destination. Just to qualify that, it's a very small number or percentage of the refugees that want to go to the UK. Compared to a million in Germany, half a million in Italy, 200,000 in France, that's a very small number. The ones that want to come to the UK normally have such a strong reason for wanting to go there, generally family ties, which is a very strong reason. You can imagine somebody who their whole family was killed in Sudan. They have one brother left and he's in the UK. Despite the small percentage of refugees overall who want to reach the UK, the British government has tried to push back by supporting and funding the French government's border control in Calais. Today, it pays French authorities about 150 million pounds to maintain the border. The situation in Calais has led to rising tensions between both countries. With the British government's unwillingness to open its borders, the city of Calais is becoming more critical of the Touquet Agreement, taking its time to address responsibility or provide even basic resources for the refugees. There's various sites that we go to at the moment. There's the main one in Calais, which is a lot of young men, and a lot of people end up when they first arrive in Calais. Then there are a couple of smaller sites in Calais. Calais is quite a tough uh, reality to see because the settlements are not legal uh, and people are de facto sleeping rough uh, with no assistance but the one the assistance they get from NGOs and other organizations. Uh, so it's not like visiting a you know, legal camp run by UNHCR where there's showers and services. Sadly in France, it very much depends on commune. In Calais, there's no water, there's no toilets, there's no support. In fact, general water taps in the street that would be on for dogs or homeless people, they turn them off. It's grim, um, unimaginably grim, really. Um, you have people struggling to get by with practically nothing. Um, they're exhausted when they get here because they've had a journey of perhaps up to a year to get here. People just indefinitely waiting uh, to cross a border that they might never be able to cross. Uh, so that's what I see, a potentially limited uh, wait. Without any legal means to cross the border and reach the UK, refugees will often try to get into the lorries that cross the channel, most of them coming out at night, when the traffic and the security are less present. 
They'll sometimes throw debris on the road in order to slow down the lorries and give them time to jump on. The tightening of the security in response to a high number of refugees doing this has made it more difficult to cross without getting caught. They have come across continents, they have come across hell, <laughs> they've come across Libya and the Sahara. It might have taken them anything from three months to two years to make that journey. They might have lost everything on the way. And then they get here and they're stopped. And that's when they lose their hope. And hope is really important to a human being. Hope is what we survive on. And when they sit in Calais and they find out that they're going to lose their dream, that they're going to lose their family maybe, that something that they've gone through hell for, they're not going to get. That's where they break. That is why Calais is so bad. There was a young boy who arrived in Calais and him and his friend arrived and they were from Eritrea and they were about 14. And they were pretty, pretty sweet and innocent. They arrived and they said, oh, Hi, we're here to go to England. <laughs> and we said, oh God, um, I'm, we're really sorry, but you're not, that's not going to happen. And they wouldn't believe us. They were just like, no, no, we are. And that there's nothing we can do at that point. You know, we can try and say, options, French asylum, it could be good. They weren't having it. So they started sleeping rough in Calais. And over the next six months, we watched them get more streetwise. We a couple of times patched them up and they'd been beaten up by the police. We saw them survive through the winter. We see, see them in the morning absolutely drenched because they hadn't found anywhere to sleep and they'd been out all night. But over that winter, they just changed from these little hopeful, nice boys to more streetwise, more roughened, more calloused. <laughs> Um, it was just really sad. The frustrating state and brutalizing conditions the refugees experience oftentimes force them to harden against other refugees and Calais citizens, and ultimately to distrust everyone around them. They're wet, they're cold, they're tired, so it makes it incredibly difficult to find them or help them. You see, you've got to be really careful when you help people, how you help, when they're desperate, really. We are doing a distribution this afternoon to Verottier. Yeah, two or three days ago, Verottier was cleared again. It's not unusual anymore, but it's still very unpleasant. And as you would have noticed, the weather has turned. It's only hopefully for a couple of days, but even so, that's going to make a miserable situation ten times worse. So when we go on distributions, uh, we go out in teams. As it stands right now, we go with one van as a rule, and then we all go out in our cars together. We always wear our gilets. When we go out, we're not actually going to a legal camp. There's no such thing. So as such, your own personal insurance will not cover you for anything that might happen, and neither will ours. That being said, nothing has ever happened, but you do need to be made aware that you are taking on yourself to go into these areas. No promises policy. We think it's obvious, but sometimes it's not. You're going to camps where people are regularly tormented, never have enough of anything, and you might go there on a, like this afternoon, you might go there and think, oh, I'm sure I saw in the warehouse we had those joggers, those jeans, those shoes and that size. We would be really letting down very vulnerable people if we couldn't come through with something that we said, oh yeah, we could do that, I'll be back in two hours. We might come back here and find it's been taken elsewhere, it was no good. And this vulnerable person will be waiting for us because we promised. So Care for Calais, which is who you're under the guise of when you're out, will be on the, the will front that. They will be the people that are like having to deal with consequences later. But more importantly, we're letting down vulnerable people and we will, we will do everything we can to never let that happen. Somebody want to go and get the tarp? The tarpaulins. Just drag it across, we'll try to sunk it. Yeah? One, two, three. 
Molly, who is ace at this, is going to be here because Molly's going to make sure that everyone comes in and are very happy. Now that leaves us one, two, three. I need two people for doors, ideally tall people, because you're going to get, thank you, James, definitely. So if I could have you stood here, please, just so I've got my door people. So the rest of us, you can just get into line. And then if we can make it so it's even each side. Because we go in environments where, as a rule, you don't know what you're going to expect. We know we have got some really important stuff on this van and people really want this. As such, what we have to do is we have to form a very safe environment, not only for refugees, but for us. So we'll find a way to manage it, should we need managing a little bit carefully. And we'll smile, just smile. Smile, you have no idea the depth of a smile for somebody that hasn't seen one for a while. So a nice smile, shake your hand, how you doing? Seriously, you want to a win-win. Any questions? Yeah? That sounds really good. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Let's go with that end, walk round. We ask not to take photos without proper permission. And proper permission doesn't mean, can I? Yes. It means you explain that you're taking the photos, you're liable to put it on social media. Many will say no at the moment, actually, and some will say yes. But again, and what I try to do is I then show them the photo I've taken, so there's no misconception. And then, because of course they talk to their friends. And then that was very, very quickly, it's like, whoa, we've created a situation we didn't need. Sarah's advice would be proven true when, as the filmmakers attempt to get permission to film and record the refugees, things become heated. Go, 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 they leave the camp planning a different approach, hoping that tomorrow will be better. The city of Calais is charming in its simplicity. Beaches are often quite busy during the summer months, and sidewalk cafes brim a stark contrast to the squalid conditions that the refugees have been subjected to in this very city. There are so many challenges and so many things that are so, so hard. The whole grassroots movement is made up of people who have no training and no experience and we've had to learn so many things and it's been so hard. Oh yeah, sweat pouring. <laughs> yeah. But you rocked it again, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Nice. Thank you. Most, yes. Mostly. And nice and quick. And you want to help them so much, but it takes all your emotional energy and your balance out of you.
it's hard to step back, but you have to. Um, there's so much to learn <laughs> and you learn most of the lessons the hard way. Um, it's hard with your family. It's hard to leave your family. Wow. <laughs> So yeah, tomorrow we're going to move all the big stuff under. over Sorry. there and we can start packing for Stevie again and take the stuff at the front, pack it, load it up and hope to find someone else and can take it back. <laughs> I know, I know. And we've still also got to pack baby wipes, water, food packs, not so much the hygiene and we'll try and find some tops. But then we found quite a bit today. So you know those tops I said to you about taking it? As I'm married with four children. A few years ago, I had a quite serious illness in France. And thanks to being in France, Eventually, I had a quite a serious operation that was very life and death scenario. And when I finally got better, I realised the amount of people that were there helping me. I tried to pay it forward and do other things in other ways. And then our youngest daughter um, was found to have a serious heart condition. And she had an operation in 2014 that didn't work. And then she had another one six weeks later, open heart surgery, which did. And again, I just felt that we have been through a lot, but we are all still together. We are still a family. We, we've still got security. And there's just so much more than many people. And I just felt it was fate that I should do something while I can. It was going to be I came once a month. And that worked okay for the first two trips, and then I was just like, yeah, but we could eat, say, just like five days, and then make it more worthwhile doing the trip. We all took a battering. I got, obviously, quite tired. The kids were getting a little bit, you know, we want to see our mum, and actually her be here, not just physically be there, but mentally be elsewhere. They're brilliant. They, they can, they are very well-rounded. They find it hard they lose their mum. There's no two ways around it. They find it hard. They, they want mum to be there for when they come home from school. They want mum to be cooking their food. You know, they, they want me to be there being mum. But I think, well, I know that they're proud because my eldest daughter actually did a post on Facebook about two and a half years ago whereby she says she finds it really hard and she wishes it didn't have to be that way. But she's glad that there's people like me. <laughs> she was really kind. So whenever I feel lonely, or why, I just remember that I'm lucky because I have three kids still living at home. One obviously is old enough now to have left, but three that live at home and they know we love them. We know we do everything we can for them and they know that they're lucky. They don't always understand it and it's hard for them as much as it's hard for me. I could stay here forever. I couldn't ever not be with my kids, just like all of these families in this situation now. You have mums in Syria and in Iraq sending their young children because they believe that is the only option for their children away. That's tough. As the filmmakers leave Calais for the day, Sarah's words about family separation will resonate with them very soon. Uh, my name is uh, Ahmad Imra Imran. I'm from Afghanistan. Uh, I am 22 years. 20 years. Sorry. Say brother, but then my brother am kushtashad. The, the, from map, I'm sure another one. Used to have two brothers, uh, one of them dead in Afghanistan, they killed him. They had a very good life. He was been happy to have this life. They, they had a supermarket with his family working together in Lakman, in one part of Afghanistan city there. They had like the people, customer, there was been like people from Taliban. They come buy some stuff from them and uh, the state of Afghanistan, the police or the army, they was com coming to buy stuff from the supermarket. And then the Taliban tell them, you give some report from us to the state, you say who we are, and you give information about what we're doing to the state. So they kill his brother because of that. They say, 
they was not working with Taliban and not working with the Afghan state government. They don't care about all of them. They do their life, but they accused them for that. So when they kill his brother, they run to Pakistan. They go as a refugee in Pakistan. They stay three years in Pakistan with all his family. And then Pakistan decided to send all the refugees back to home country. So then they don't have any other choice to left Afghanistan and come to Europe. He was been with, with his parent until Iran. His father name is Shir Ali. His mother is Bijan. And his younger brother is 15 years old. His name is Omar. They was with all the family together and smuggler they decide to take the parent separately and he and his brother separately. They make them in two groups. So he lost his parent separate from them from Iran and he was been in with his brother until Serbia. Since year they are he don't have any contact with his brother and his parent in Iran. Uh, before I was uh, in uh, Italian, uh, Slovenia, Serbia, Greece, uh, Turkey, Iran. It's very dangerous. Many people, they lost their life in the, in the middle of the way, arriving until here. Many people, they dead in the middle of the way. They lost their family. They lost their life. So they say it's very hard. Ahmad's story is identical to most refugees that fled to Europe. And reaching Europe comes at a steep price. They speak of giving up everything, selling everything they own in order to raise the funds that will allow them to pay smugglers who will help them cross the high-risk borders. He self and other refugees before coming in Europe, they sell everything they have. All like if they had a house or if they have, they sell all their stuff to paying the, to the smuggler for arriving until here and they have nothing back home, they have anything. The path to Europe for most refugees coming from Afghanistan, Iraq and Syria often starts near the Turkish border as they try to get to the Turkish coast. According to a United Nations statistic, Turkey currently hosts an estimated 3.5 million refugees. For those wanting to get to Europe, they'll need to cross the Aegean Sea which will get them to Greece. However, an agreement between Turkey and the EU in March of 2016 has tightened the border, making it nearly impossible for refugees to reach the Greek islands. Those that do are sent back to Turkey under this agreement. Refugees coming from the Middle East will walk through the Balkans or Central Europe to reach their country of preference in Western Europe. With the recent construction of a border fence in Hungary, and the dramatic shift in Italy's politics regarding refugees, it has made it more and more difficult to reach Western Europe. The police often arrest refugees. Sometimes they'll release them after keeping them in detention centers. Other times, they'll send them back to the first European Union country they entered. In Slovenia. The police arrest them, take his fingerprint. And in Italy, they arrest them again one day. They take the fingerprint and then they let them again outside. The Dublin regulation, adopted in 2003, stipulates that the first EU country to receive a refugee is responsible for his or her asylum application and process. The Dublin system says that you cannot ask for asylum in another country but the first country you arrive to. So this leads to two problems. The first problem is that because there are no legal routes to reach countries, people have to travel illegally. And the second problem is that so many migrants don't, don't want to apply to, or refugees, want to be refugees, don't want to apply to any country for asylum, you know, don't want to go to any country in Europe. But they want to go to a specific country. They want to go to France because they speak French. They want to go to the UK because they speak English or because they have a family member there. And if you make them apply to the first country they reach, they will go underground and again, they will subject themselves to crazy, you know, human trafficking. This puts the refugees in very dangerous situations where they can only rely most exclusively on NGOs along the way. On their journeys, they have to contend with extreme cold, heat, extensive travel on foot, some even barefoot, 
through the mountains of Intimilia to reach France from Italy. Ahmad traveled with a group of 15 people on his attempt to reach Europe. By the end of the journey, only four of them had survived it. There was been 15, uh, uh, six people from Afghanistan, six mm -hmm. others from Iran, and three Arabs from the Arab country. You are four of them arriving here. So one or two, each country, they lost one or two of them because they was been ill, they lost their power, they cannot survive and coming all the way. And no water to drink, no eat to eating, and the group has become less and less and less. And while the eastern Mediterranean route that Ahmad took is very dangerous, the journey that the African refugees have to take is far more dangerous and deadly. Most Eritreans, Ethiopians, and Sudanese will have to walk through the Sahara, where the climate conditions are incredibly rough. They then have to go through Libya, a country that has been completely destabilized since the beginning of its civil war and the death of Gaddafi in 2011. Libya is hell. Libya is, is horrific, and the stories that we are hearing about Libya are so bad at the moment. And, I mean, it's out there in the media anyway. I mean, there's been, I think the stories of people being sold as slaves in Libya really hit the headlines. Um, we have a lot of people, a lot of people now that we talk to who have been beaten, electrocuted, in prisons, raped. No, no woman gets across Libya without being raped. Recently, news reports and videos depicting slave trade in Libya have surfaced. And as of the completion of this film, between 500,000 to a million refugees are still stuck in Libya, with the outside world having very little knowledge of what specific horrors they go through. For the very few who somehow manage to pay smugglers and reach the Libyan coast, the harrowing Mediterranean journey to Europe begins. This route to Europe is the deadliest. More than 33,000 refugees have drowned in the Mediterranean trying to enter Europe since 2000, about 13,000 of those between 2015 and 2018. NGOs have been working tirelessly to rescue and aid ships at sea, but are facing heavy setbacks, especially with the Italian government's refusal to accept any rescue ships not sailing under an Italian flag. To reach Europe is a feat in itself. To reach Calais is almost a miracle. And Ahmad is among the lucky ones. He said he wished to go as soon as possible to be with his family again, all of them together, stay with his family, his father, mother, and his younger brother. But he said, the unfortunately, because of the condition and the situation, that is not possible today. But if that is happened one day, they don't risk anything. He would like to go back to his country and stay with his family. Yes, he said the life actually have is not good to being far away from his family, from his younger brother. He's worried for his younger brother. He don't know where is his brother right now. How is his condition? How is his situation? Where are they, his parents? So he say, he's, he, right now he don't feeling good. going on today. Um, we're not out on distribution, so we're having a massive clear out. We're currently sorting out the Care for Calais charity shop over there. Um, we have Luke here. He's helping to put out the tent. Um, we're making sure they're in the best condition possible. They need to be waterproof. They need to be able to stay in the ground. Um, they've got to be sturdy, no rips, no nothing, because they're just not going to do the job they're there for. What number are you on now today? How many tents have you done? Well, we've had about 
two or three successful added. ones and lots of ones that we found weren't suitable. Yeah. So this is the pile of tents that are no good. So as you can see here, they're ripped and they're just they're not going to help anybody and it's a shame. Here is our food, our canned food. Um, and Alvaro is currently building our shelves up again. It's looking great. Um, we had a, so much more than this a while back and it's the same across the warehouse in every section. We just don't have enough. The good old days, <laughs> which I'm talking two years ago, not so old, this warehouse was full and it came from all all manners and then the crisis has I don't know I think people may have I don't know <laughs> refugee fatigue I have no idea because now you battle to get everything and get sponsorship to get donations to get money to get interest so it makes a lot of stress it's interesting that there's so much um like shortages of specific things. Yeah, there's a lot to do and not that many people to do it. We've changed a lot because we've had to change as the situation changes. And probably the big thing now, like I say, is the fact that we know that this is not gonna go away. Um, so we need to make our organization more sustainable, which is really difficult. Um, there isn't the same support that there was in the UK when we first started. It's gone out of social media, it's gone out of the news, people have got used to it. So we are going to have to learn to be more active in seeking donations and seeking volunteers. I think a lot of people have forgotten about Calais in a, for a while because the jungle's not there anymore. Uh, but obviously we saw that there's a lot of people still in a very horrible situation, in tents, without food or water, and they're relying on volunteers to sort of help them out. Yeah, the conditions have changed a lot because it, at first there was one big camp, which everybody called the jungle in um, Calais. The jungle in Calais was a refugee camp that gained attention for the sheer volume of refugees camping there. From the moment the first refugee arrived in the jungle to the moment it was destroyed, many thousands passed through. Between 8,000 and 10,000 were still calling it home when it was demolished in October 2016. They were large concentrations. The jungle had, you know, substantial wooden buildings. It had a big church, it had a big school that was built out of wood, it had shops, restaurants, all that kind of stuff. So there was a certain amount of kind of semi-permanent structures, which is exactly what the French government didn't want. And that's what they destroyed in um, October 2016. In preparation for the destruction of the jungle, refugees were assured they would have the opportunity to apply for asylum as they were dispersed all over France. However, within a few days, those still hoping to cross the border began to return to Calais. We are now in Calais, where the old jungle used to be. And as you can see now, there is no many, no person live here because they destroy the jungle and they move everybody. And you can smell how it smells bad here because of the sand and all the factory around. And because there is the chemical factory near to us. And all the sand, they bring them, they bring uh, and they put some chemical stuff on it so it smells very bad. You can even not breathing good. The camp was horrible, don't get me wrong, I hated the camp, but at least it had some structure. Now people don't have tents. Um, in the camp we used to say how awful it was that people were sleeping in tents in the winter. But now people are sleeping rough in the winter with no tents and no shelter and nothing to protect them from the wind and the rain. Those structures have gone now and they, 
although people still talk about the camps, we still talk about the camps. There are no camps. There are no camps. These guys are living in the undergrowth, in industrial areas, in old factories, on bits of concrete, any piece of waste ground. And they're living in from day to day in the woods. To a certain degree, you're always trying to locate people. And because there is no official refugee camp, there's no security, even in numbers anymore, it's, it's a hard job to make sure you reach everybody that needs help. Yeah. This family arrived the day before. The baby, bitten by a bug that made his finger swell up, could only be given a band-aid by the volunteers and film crew since no one can take responsibility for them, not knowing if he had any allergies or other infirmities, prohibited any treatment completely. If they're lucky, they'll have a tent somewhere where they won't get spotted for a few days, but within a few days, it's fairly likely that the police will have identified where people are, they will have come through with pepper spray in one hand to make people leave their tents and then with a knife in the other to slash the tents. This camp, referred to as Dunkirk because of the proximity to its namesake, was cleared two days after the film crew left. Before it was cleared, Dunkirk was the only camp with running water, showers and toilets. After it was cleared, its inhabitants were loaded onto buses that took them several hours away. By the time the film crew returned to capture the aftermath, many of the refugees had also returned. Shakar took the journey with his parents and two younger sisters. We go to a flat is so far away. It's in bus, we are five hours in the bus, five hours. You know, they come over five hours again, then without Sorry. money. When they go inside train, train, no money, and you know, so ticket they man, they come, you say, where is your ticket? No ticket, okay, next station you, who should you go outside? We must go down, go to uh, the next station. The train, three train. They left Iraq a year ago, and while they're under constant threat by the police and Calais officials, they still hope to reach the UK eventually. He said, he said when you go to UK, I like to be better life. Good life. My name is Zirian, I'm one of, nearly one month in India. I'm he said, I lost my family in Iraq because ISIS uh, come to our city. They destroy our city. Well, I can't how to be any hat and Bazor, Bridian, Leocana, Quayan, Cardino, Fari Pass, Sepas, and Guyan, Womia, Cocino, Bridian, Boro, Lin, Baro, Paris. Police come, they say Bazaar. police come 7 o'clock in the morning, bring three boss, they come, take everything, then take, uh, you know, single person, take everyone, it's like pushing, they take uh, nearly Paris far away. Hamza, the film crew's translator for the Dunkirk camp, helped with bridging the gap between the filmmakers and the refugees. He left his wife and two daughters in Iraq as he attempts to get into the UK. I hope to get to, uh, I hope to go to England and that's why I have family in England. In Iraq, situation very bad, you know, group uh, called ISIS, like group come in, like uh, band, sometimes take kids and family, they know if you are rich or you have some money, take your wife and children, then he's kidnapped, they say I need money, if you know give money, I, you know, have a chance to see daughter or family. All say, I say, I like, it's European in lucky, they born in UK, in Europe, because Iraq's situation very bad.
On the other side of the camp, the filmmakers meet a family of six. A former police officer in Iraq, Ali fled with his wife and four young daughters after receiving death threats. As an officer, his job was to identify and dismantle bombs, and his left hand bears the scars of that job. He has lost several fingers and has only recently regained full use of the hand itself. He shares the details of the early morning raid and clearing of the camp. Police had, police had, they say, they say police come destroy our tent. This, at the time we, we make breakfast for children, make breakfast for children. They know let me give uh, egg, uh, give to my children. He say no, after you left, you leave this place. He say in tent, they bring a knife. He's cutting over the tank. He said it was a knife breaking the tank. He said this is tank uh, even for kids. They know thing about tank this for kids. They cut our tank by night. He's saying, police, they took us to this road. They have uh, police bring three bus. When three bus full, he said, okay, you can go back. This is like game. I've seen bombardments of tear gas in the days when the camp was there, bombardments of tear gas, sometimes because hundreds of people were, um, were in an area where the police felt it wasn't secure, other times for absolutely no reason at all and with no disturbance. She'll have the CRS come along, they'll completely evict the camp, trash tents, scare people, um, and then 12 hours later, People are homeless, no tents, no sleeping bags, and it starts all over again. It could be they go 500 yards away, it could be they stay in the same camp and just come back. Is It's like putting a sticking plaster on an arterial bleed. I just feel that everything we do, it's a stopgap for today, tomorrow maybe. But now, with the increased violence, with the CRS sitting there feeling that they can destroy, it, it does nothing but dehumanise refugees stigmatise them, trauma, traumatise them. All they're doing, I feel now, is trying to kick the volunteers and the associations in the face. Stop spending your money on a new tent and a new this because we're going to trash it anyway. And we will do everything we can to replace what's damaged, but they're right. We don't have a never-ending pot of money. We don't have tents in their hundreds of thousands being delivered so we can just keep giving it out all the time. The indiscriminate use of tear gas um, in the middle of the night when the camp was when the camp was entirely peaceful. Sleep deprivation is used as a torture technique, and that is what they are using here. The police beat them. Um, there's nowhere for them to hide. It's pretty difficult. It's pretty difficult when you get a crisis moment, when someone gets cleared, or you know when a particularly horrible incident of. Viciousness happens when the police were stealing one shoe from the refugees. What's that about? That's about humil humiliating someone, isn't it? That's about making a human being feel terrible, feel, feel that they're not a human being. And not just how the French state, but actually how the British state is willing to treat people, because ultimately Britain pays for this. Every tear gas canister that's fired Britain has paid for. We fund the police operation here as we fund the fence and the wall 
Um, and ultimately, it really is what the UK are happy with. Um, the UK government are pleased to have somebody else do their dirty work of building a massive wall and using violence to deter people rather than using a pair of ears to listen to people's story and decide whether or not we can help in some way. It's estimated that the UK has spent £100 million on border security in the Calais area in 2016 and 2017, with the promise to spend an additional £44.5 million during the Anglo-French summit in January 2018. It will bring the total to £150 million. However, it's unclear when and how this additional money will be paid out. These are all genuine, regular stories. This is what's happening. This is what it is now to be a refugee in Europe. It's going on in Calais, it's going on in Sicily, it's going on in Greece, in, you know, in Spain, in Portugal. Like, there are so many realities like Calais that need to be solved because it's taking place in our countries and we do nothing to fix, fix it, really. The worst thing I've ever seen is the fact that this situation is created by governments and other human beings and it's directed against human beings. That's the, that's the real offence. There's a whole stream of thought that holds that the migration issue has been securitized, so it has become a security issue rather than a humanitarian issue. And as such, it has been tackled with security means rather than with humanitarian means. Terrorism has obviously played um, a role in it because there's Another step has been the nexus between migrants and terrorists. So the, the, the public discourse in the US and Europe has been to link the migrant to, to terrorism. Extreme right-wing movements have grown considerably, especially during the wave of recent refugee surges. I think we live in societies that are dominated by fear and insecurity and you know the migrant is the, is the perfect scapegoat. It's like intrinsic to who we are because it's you know the globalized world that, that confuses us and like makes us feel like we have no roots, no security, you know jobs don't last 20 years anymore, they last two and so we, we have this constant anxiety and we need to blame someone for it and it's so easy to blame the alien and the person we don't know. Italy has seen the rise of a populist movement under the leadership of Matteo Salvini. In France, Marine Le Pen, leader of the extreme right party Front National, was defeated by Emmanuel Macron by a wide margin. We have to close our borders straight away, immediately, and that's what I'll do the moment I take power. Immediately after my arrival au pouvoir. However, Macron's response to France's immigration issues has been one of more fences and tighter border controls. Germany, which has accepted the largest number of refugees in Europe, has hosted about 1.4 million refugees since the crisis began in 2015. It has since been used to politicize certain incidents with refugees, many of the stories seeming to polarize their history as well as their intentions. Angela Merkel's party, CDU, has seen a drastic decline in popularity. As of the completion of this film, she stated she will not be seeking re-election in 2021. Germany had the best policy in Europe. And now look at it. Now she's under pressure. The, the Bavarian allies have, have, have become allies of the far right. We treat them as economic migrants, so we don't give them any international protection. We don't give them any... But they still have the right to come to the West, you know, because they're still fleeing life-threatening situations. And so we need to solve that, and I, I honestly, I don't know how. To be granted asylum, a refugee needs to be able to prove that his or her life is in danger on account of race, religion, political views, or membership in a particular social group under threat of persecution. It can take months, even years, depending on the country, for asylum seekers to be granted refugee status. The newspapers have managed to put out this myth that they are economic migrants and they have peddled it to such an extent and repeated it to such an extent that people really believe it. A lot of people really believe that the refugees in Calais are economic migrants. And it doesn't make any sense because 
you know, <laughs> they all arrived. They all arrived at a time when there was a massive increase in conflicts in the Middle East. And so it's a bit of a coincidence that they all arrived at the time when the wars were going on. And if you look at where they come from, they come from, well, at first they came from Syria. A lot of them come from Afghanistan. A lot of them come from Sudan. And if you look at the Global Peace Index, that is the three most dangerous countries in the world, in the whole world. <laughs> they are listed as the most dangerous countries. When they did close the Calais camp, and they bust them all out and they took them to the centres around France and they processed them. And it took months, it took absolutely months. The process was so slow. And loads of them had to go through it twice as well because they take them through it once and they appeal and they take them through the courts. But it was done and it took two years, some of them, but they've all been done. And guess what? 86% of them, 86% were granted asylum in France. And believe me, France does not grant asylum easily. They absolutely try everything they can, everything to not grant them asylum. 86% of them are granted asylum. That means that they are genuine refugees. A 2016 asylum statistic shows that 98.1% of Syrian refugees were granted asylum on first instance decision, 63.5% of Iraq refugees, and 92.5% of Eritreans. Until you prove they're not a refugee, you assume they are. You support, you house, you let children go to school, you let them have a routine. If you can prove legally and fairly through a proper system that actually they're not refugees, fair enough, you can take that support away. But instead of just assuming that they're not a refugee, instead of assuming they're just here to claim benefits, because of course you want to come to France, live in the middle of a mud field, and then sit there and beg for everything you get because that's what you want to claim for, you should be providing support. When they do the opinion surveys in the UK, what, what it tends to show is that most people don't object to genuine refugees being given asylum. Most people, you know, if somebody is genuinely in trouble, they, they do want to help them. The problem is, it's this um, ongoing rhetoric that they're not refugees, that they are economic migrants. Look at, it, look at where they're coming from. Look at the look at the way it's phrased. So in some cases, it's about the number of migrants. Germany, pr primarily. Yeah. In some cases, it's supposedly about Christian culture. In Britain, it's about security and our borders and all this stuff. But throughout all of it, there's this current of Islamophobia. The world has a lot of problems, and we don't have answers for them. But the answer is not to build a wall around Europe and just be glad that we are born here and not there. The answer is not to bury our head in the sands. The most important thing is to bring uh, the, the problem uh, in, the in, in the political discourse, in the political debate. So I, I'm in favour of volunteering and I think it's absolutely necessary. I do not think it is enough. So I think uh, if we want to change something, then uh, we have to face the problem politically. And uh, yeah, charity uh, is not enough. The crossover between what is and is not political is, has changed. The, the earth has shifted under our feet. Um, we have to speak up for the refugees because there's nobody else to do it. If we can't change the world, if we can't change what, ha what is happening, at the very least we can be the ones to stand up and say we believe this is wrong. And then one day when somebody looks back on this, there will be somebody in the UK who said this is wrong. We won't have all sat down and said we're too busy to notice or we're going to let this happen. You should be providing support. We should be providing support. People, not just volunteers. We can all do so much and it could change and we could help people. Just like when we needed help in the war, we searched out, we got that help, we were supported. You know, no one, no one turned a, a horrible face at the fact that people were helping the Jewish children flee Germany to come to England for safety. That was acceptable, but it's not acceptable now because it happens to be another country trying to come into Europe that fleeing for the same safety, the same support. And actually you ask all genuine refugees, they do not 
want to be here. They want to be safe. They want to be at home. They want to not be bombed. They want to be not tortured. They want to be sitting there, not watching their family members being tortured and abused and beheaded. They don't want this. They want to be safe and have their lives. So refugees need our help. And I just don't understand how anyone cannot look at this global picture and not be like, what can we do? And if we all did something, instead of dividing us, instead of the government's trying to tell us it's all bad and it's a horrible word and these people aren't worth bothering with, we could unite and we could support. And it wouldn't even overly cost us an awful lot, but a bit of thought. Countries in developing regions continue to host the majority of the world's refugees. Approximately 85% of all refugees at the end of 2017 were in countries in developing regions. Many of these countries are already dealing with substantial barriers to sustainable development, which makes it even more challenging for them to continue to host more refugees. The five wealthiest countries, which make up half the global economy, are hosting less than 5% of the world's refugees, while 86% of refugees are in poorer developing countries that are often struggling to meet the needs of their own people. The global refugee crisis continues to dominate headlines. Most recently, the caravan of migrants, escaping violence and starvation from Central America, trying to seek asylum in the United States. Rohingya Muslims living in Myanmar have been denied citizenship based on ethnicity. They were forced to flee after what UN officials have described as ethnic cleansing in the form of extreme violence perpetrated against them. It is believed as many as 43,700 of them have been murdered. The survivors fled to neighboring Bangladesh, where they are currently stateless, meaning they are not citizens of any country. A recent development in October 2018 has Bangladesh sending them back to Myanmar, where they'll most assuredly be subjected to more violence. Today, there are an estimated 10 million stateless people in the world. No provisions have been put in place to address this issue. Governments and news media are calling this grand displacement of people an immigration issue, a security issue, and a refugee crisis. The crisis is so enormous. Um, like, it feels like a drop in the ocean, but there's a really good quote over there and it says, you can't help everyone, but everyone can help someone. So, or as somebody else said, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. So you do what you can. I'm glad I came, but I'm glad I could do something to help someone. But at the same time, um, I, I recognize that the problem is so much bigger. Somebody did say to me after my very first visit to Calais and they wanted to find out how they could help and they wanted to uh, just to make some sense of it. And actually the last thing she said after we'd had our meeting was that makes no sense at all. And I still hold true that really none of this makes any sense. Well, no, I knew it was bad, but obviously now with a bigger insight, you actually get to see the real situation. And I think it's worse than what we're told. It's nothing. It's nothing. Say so you give out 400 sleeping bags or 400 tents or some biscuits or some food or some dates or you make them smile for a minute but then they go home. But that's what Care for Cali do. We're here because nobody else was doing it. We're here because it needed doing and nobody else was doing that. But also that's kind of our philosophy. We, all, we try to always do what nobody else is doing. So if there is a place that nobody else is going, if there is an area that there's no other associations operating in, if there are people that are the most in need, that's always where we try to go. I hope we're not needed. 
I hope we're going to shut those doors and say, care for Calais, finished, because it's all sorted, because the world has opened its eyes, realised it's the problem, fixed the problem properly, and nobody needs us anymore. That's what I hope for. And until they do, then we will be here, and we will be doing everything we're doing now, and we'll carry on. That's what I hope for. I don't regret ever coming. It's been difficult. Um, occasionally it's been really scary, you know, you've been under pressure and all that, but if you want to understand the situation, not only the surface, not only the, the, the kind of, if you like, the vision of the situation, but if you want to understand the situation that's like the one that's going on in Europe, come and see it. Because you make a difference, you know, I mean, it don't matter who you are or whether you stay for a day or a month or a year. The truth of the matter is, that the operations that not only this organisation but all the, the refugee support organisations run make a difference to the lives of refugees. It's how they get food, it's how they get clothes and boots. Most importantly, it's how they get a bit, a bit of respect and a bit of dignity because people treat them properly. And once you've been here and seen that an awful lot of people are okay with the situation that refugees here are living in, it's very hard to leave it alone. They're absolutely compelled to keep coming back to chip away to do what really is only a very, very small attempt um, at just making life slightly better for today or for tomorrow. Um, it's a, in a sense, it's a very simple thing. It's a, it doesn't even have to be a political thing. Uh, it's very simple. You come here, you realise what people are going through, and all you can really promise is to try and make tonight better than last night. Um, but if you can do that, that is something. I promised myself that I would come here as much as possible, probably every month if I can. Uh, it's so easy to you know, make the trip from London. It's all a matter of financial uh, capacity, really, uh, in, my, in my case. But yeah, absolutely, I will come back. I'm definitely happy I came and I want to come back and I think coming back in winter might be a different experience because it's a lot colder, um, there's probably less volunteers here, they probably need more supplies. Refugees realise that it's not fair and it's not right but without volunteers there really would be nothing for, for them at all now so there's a mutual respect as a rule, I think. Seeing people be happy when we are meet them, they see how the different to being a volunteer or when the volunteer they go try to help them, make different for them. So that is very important for me. Uh, so some of them, they are very happy when they see we are there to help them. And we are, every European people are not the same, so there is some people care for them. We have a bad situation in here and uh, we th thank for your volunteering group because you help us, you bring everything like main thing, so, uh, you bring uh, stuff for family and for kids and you give uh, big help for them. Then you buy everything uh, you bring for this old people, we know who spend the money is very good, especially Lots of people in here, they don't have money. Ali is now in the UK with his family. Their asylum application is currently being processed. Say if I if I be in the UK I need to build nice life for myself. I want to go to UK be a relaxed life and I want to go to to the What do you want to be when you grow up? A football player. Oh. <laughs>
ما خوال برشان سلامای خدا تقدیم میکنم در جای باشن با پناه خدا باشن دیگه واقعا زندگی به این رقم ایچ پیش نمیره ایچ خوشایند نیست دور از پدر و از مادر باشیم از آینده بیادر ما نمیفهمم کجاست دیگه میخوایم که با هم یک جای زندگی کنیم He wished them a good day and he wanted to say to them hi and he hoped they are fine and he wished they are going to be together as soon as possible and be as a normal family which is live with his parents, his brother, staying together. We want to speak English, we want to have a good education, we want to have a good education, we want to have a good education, he hoped to have a good education, start studying, do a good job, good work, and have a good future. And his life be useful in his life.